My name is Pastor Ralph Miley, and I'd just like to welcome you to La Mirada Four Square Church. And I just want to open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We praise you and bless you. We thank you, Father, for your greatness. We pray, Father, that you would be honored this day, that the name of Jesus Christ would be exalted, and that you, by your spirit, would move on our hearts and work in our hearts, that you might work your will so that you might be glorified. And in this, we just give you thanks and praise and honor and glory. For it's in Jesus Christ's mighty name we pray. Amen.
you're worthy of all the glory, God. We love you today, God. We bless you, Lord, in this place. There is nothing like you, God. There's nothing like your love. We bless you, God. You are holy. You are welcome in this place, Lord. We welcome you with our worship. We welcome you with our praise today, God. There is no one like you in all the earth. No one who deserves the glory and the honor and the power and the praise. There's no one like our God today. He is good to us. He is loyal. He is faithful. He is caring. He is kind. We love you today, Lord. We bless you today, God. Never runs out on me. 
Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love, it's your dry, never empty, never failing love, the perfect love that casts out all fear, your wonderful, powerful, glorious love that fills every part, fills every need, it's your love today. There's nothing like 
love us even and during our darkest time and our brokenness and our weariness and the things we find ourselves going through you continue to love us and our doubts and our frustrations and our anger you still continue to love us and that father that that love is eternal because it says that you are love that means your love is all powerful all knowing and ever present and that your love can break through the the darkness that tries to enshroud us and that your light would shine forth out from it, Father, and that we would be delivered and set free by the power of your great love. And so, Father, we bless you, Lord, O oh, our souls, and all that is within us. We bless your holy name. For great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And so, Father, we bless you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We lift up your holy name, for there is no one like unto you. And we just thank you for your presence that is here, that you continue to minister to us. We ask, Father, that the name of Jesus Christ would be exalted. We thank you for the privilege to be able to come and praise you this day because this is a day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And so we lift up our hands, Father, before you, thanking you for your love that provides, your love that heals, your love that gives us peace, your love that covers us and surrounds us, and your love that caused your son, that, that your son went on the cross and died. But he rose again, Father, by your power. And it is because of that great love that we have relationship with you. And so we thank you for this day. Again, this is a day that we, we, you have made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. And in this we just give you thanks in Jesus' most holy and precious name. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Well, happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you fathers-to-be. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Um, I just want to always uh, thank the Lord uh, for the privilege and opportunity to be able to share his word with you. And uh, if you have, there's a paper uh, near you, and it has the scripture's notes. Uh, there may be some next to you. There's some in the back if you don't have enough. And I would encourage you to write, underline, make notes, uh, cross out, just in case you found something that don't, you don't particularly like. But uh, there will be something as you read the word of God that will stand out, that will speak to you. And that is the Spirit of the Lord speaking to you. Again, that is the Spirit of the Lord speaking to you. Uh, before we get started, uh, is there going to be youth today? Is Miss Kimberly here? Okay, there'll be no youth today. No youth, okay? So, one of the things I always speak Oh, there is youth today. All right, youth, you are dismissed. You are dismissed. And I always read out of, of 1 Peter 4.11, and it reads like this. It says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if anyone serves, let him serve by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, the title of this message would be Weep with Those Who Weep, Part 2. And one of the things that 
I myself you know, might struggle with is, you know, is this a message of the Lord to the body of Christ, or is this just Pastor Ralph venting? And so I, and, and so I struggle with that, and I pray that, that the word that I speak would be the word of the Lord to his people. And we have Romans 12, verses 15 and 16. And it reads like this. It says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Now, one thing I, I like about having, you know, just I have a wonderful pastoral st staff is talking with them and sharing with them the word of God and what the Lord has put on my heart. And I was talking uh, to Pastor Michael Chavez, and he had this, he said to me, and, and, and I have it in quotes for those of you that have your notes, it says, how can we expect to bring healing to a broken world if we can't bring healing to a broken house? In other words, how can we expect to bring healing to the world when the body of Christ is broken? And I was, again, this is just my opinion, but you know, I listen to talk radio and I look at social media and I see the body of Christ is fractured especially on this topic you know, of racism. You know, you have one segment of the body of Christ who's weeping and, and looking for justice. Then you have another section of the body of Christ that says oh, racism doesn't exist. And then you just have another segment of the body of Christ that says, why, don't, why are we on this subject for so long? Let's just move on. And what that speaks to me is that we're fragmented. And I myself am personally grieved by it. And I wonder if, if the Holy Spirit is grieved by it. I, I have one of my brothers in Christ, uh, he, he posted on Facebook, he said, America does have a small problem with racism. You know, a small problem. Have any of you ever had a splinter in your foot? Oh my goodness. And now a splinter is not very big, but if it, gets in, if it gets in your foot, it affects your whole body. You begin to limp, and every time you step on it, you notice it. And, and, and if the splinter is really intense, you step on it wrong, wrong and it just sends a, a sharp pain through your leg. And all it is is a small splinter. And what can happen is that we can see certain some things as small, and we can choose to ignore it. But have you ever ignored a splitter? I don't think you can. And what happens with that splitter, if you do ignore it, what happens, it goes deeper into your foot. And then ultimately, you know what happens if you leave it in there long enough? That skin begins to heal around it. And even though your skin is healed, is the splitter gone? No. All you have to do is step wrong on it and you find where, oh, that splinter is still in there. And a lot of times the best thing to do is when you get that, first get that splinter, first thing you do, you try to get it out immediately. But if it stays in there and the flesh grows over it, guess what you have to do next? You have to cut it out. Or have you ever had a blister? Now a blister is just a small thing. But if you have a blister on your foot, that affects your whole body. And that's, and that's what I think happens. And you know what you have to do with a blister? You have to cut it sometimes. Let that water drain out. <laughs> but there's a cutting that is involved when you have things like that. And, so, and, and I believe when we fail to deal with certain issues and ignore it, it's like that splinter. You know, we cover it up. But really, does it go away? No. And what happens is all we have to do is step wrongly on it to know that it's there. And I find that the body of Christ, to me, is, just, is becoming fractured. 
because people get offended. You have this group that says, oh, there's no racism. And the people who believe that there is racism is offended by the group that doesn't believe that there's racism. And they say, you know, I don't even want to talk to you anymore. That's fragmentation. And that is what I am seeing. Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 25, says this. It says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify, sanctified means to set apart, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be, would be holy, and blameless. And right now, I, I think the church needs to go to the dry cleaners because we're wrinkled and stained and fractured. We, we need to be washed by the water of the word. And a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll quote certain scriptures, and one of them that we'll quote is, you know, Chronicles, Second, second Chronicles, seven, uh, and usually we quote verses 14 and 15, it says, my people will call by my name, they humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and will heal their land. But I don't think you can have verses 14 without looking at verse 13. And look at what it says. If I, this is the Lord speaking, if I shut up the heavens, so that there is no rain. Or if I command the locusts to, uh, to devour the land, or if I send pestilence, or that some translation says plague or disease, among my people. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. Now looking at the context, brothers and sisters, I, I just want to show you what the Word of God says if we're going to quote that scripture. If we look at it, we can't av avoid verse 13 as to who, is br who brought on the pestilence. Who does it say? The Lord. So the Lord brought on the pestilence, and this, this message is not to the world. The message is to who? It says, my people who are called by my name. So he's talking to believers. He's not talking to the world. And then this healing that he talks about is conditional. It's based on us, what? Humbling and praying and seeking and turning. And I think what the Lord needs to do, sometimes the Lord will bring certain things in our life just to expose certain things. He'll bring it as though you need to deal with this area because I think specific uh, ailments require specific treatment. For example, when I was being treated for cancer, you know, when I was sitting in the waiting room, there were many patients in that waiting room waiting to be treated for all types of cancer. And there were all types of cancers that were represented in that waiting room. But specific cancers required specific treatments. For like a thyroid cancer was treated differently than prostate cancer, which is treated differently than brain cancer. And so we have to be specific and how we deal with these things. We have to, I think we have to be specific. And one of the things, like if you are dealing with, you know, like uh, you're presented with lust, it doesn't say rebuke lust, it says run from it. It doesn't say rebuke it, it says run from it. I've told this story before, a pastor uh, of one of our churches, a church I used to go to, West Andrews Four Square Church, he went to go and he went, this lady called him up and said, hey, I need you to pray over me. And he went over there, he went to an apartment by himself, and he said, okay, then I'll pray for you. 
And then uh, he went to the apartment. He, uh, she let, her, let him in, and she was in a robe, and then she dropped her robe, and there was nothing underneath it. And she said, Pastor, I need you to anoint this. Now, the pastor didn't rebuke it. The pastor didn't bind the devil. He ran out of there. He said when she dropped that rope, he ran down the stairs, got in the car, and drove off. And the next time she calls up, she, he brought a whole bunch of women with him. All right, then. So one of the things that, so there are certain sins that require certain treat, uh, treatments. And like if you have the, 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 the sin of pride, you have to humble yourselves. And what I, I'm seeing in Facebook and what I'm seeing on social media, which grieves me especially, is that people are posting people's, you know, people who have died, people who are suffering, you know, loss of business, uh, people who are suffering and, and going through uh, d difficult times. And what they're doing is that they're posting these tragedies in order to make a point. They're not posting the tragedy for you to pray for them. They're not posting you the tragedy to, to, uh, to offer a place that you can give to them. They're just posting their suffering so they can bring a point as they're trying to present something. They're using their grief, they're using their tragedy to prove a point. When we weep with those who weep, one of the things that we should do is that we should pray and intercede and, and grieve with them. The body of Christ is in need of a healing. And these are things being posted by believers. And the healing that the Lord wants to bring on us is, is conditional. And one of the conditions that it is required is that we humble ourselves. Now, this is just uh, my opinion out of the book of Ralph, is that the Lord brings on certain things so that he can expose certain things that we have to deal with. You ever have a doctor? What does he do? One of the things that if he's examined your, your stomach, he starts pressing on it, and what does he ask? Does it hurt? And if it hurts, he says, oh, all right then. I can deal, this is what I have to deal with. And it's the same thing with the body of Christ. I think the Lord presses on certain areas, some certain sensitive areas, and if we say, ouch, he says, okay then, this is what I have to deal with. This is what I'm going to have to come and bring out and deal with in your life. And that's what I think that he's doing with the body of Christ now. Now, one of the things, we can either, he's can, he can take us around this mountain as, often as, 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 we, as we do it. He says, well, how many times do you have to go around this mountain before you get it? Or it, we may just not enter into the promise. He'll just wait for the next generation. That's what we have to be concerned about. And, 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 and we look at what he says. He says, these conditions and humbling, and then he says, when, he, when, when, when we humble ourselves and all these other things, then he will hear from heaven. He will forgive their sin and heal their heal their land. Now I want to go back uh, to Romans chapter 12, verses 15 and 16, and I'm looking it out of the Amplified Bible, the, the classic edition. Again, this is Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 15 out of the Amplified. It says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joys, and weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, snobbish, high-minded, exclusive, but readily adjust yourselves to people and things and give yourselves to humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceit. So why would the Lord want us to weep with those who weep. Because I believe when you, when you enter into weep with those who weep, there's a brokenness that occurs between the people who come together. There, there is this weeping that happens. And when you begin to weep with one another and you enter into that brokenness uh, with, with your brother or sister, this is what happens. And this is in Psalm chapter 30, uh, Psalm 34, starting with verse 17. And then again, this is out of the Amplified Classic Edition. It says, let the righteous cry for help. The Lord hears and delivers them out of all their distress 
and trouble. The Lord is close to those who are of a broken heart and saves such who are crushed with sorrow from sin and humbly and thoroughly, and who are humbly and thoroughly penitent. Many evils confront the consistently righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So when there is a brokenness that, you, that, we, that we enter in, if we weep with those who weep, if we humble ourselves and weep with those who weep, it says that the Lord is what? He will save those who are crushed in their spirit. It, and he, will, he is close to those who are broken heart. So if you are broken, if you are weeping, and if you are crushed, the Lord says, I am close to you, and I will save you. And if we enter into that weeping together, guess what? The Lord can come in and begin to do that work in us. So this is what he's talking about when we sometimes are crushed. And some of us are still crushed beside certain things. The Lord, I'm close to you, and I will save you. But then there's another part to it. Now, this is Jeremiah, chapter 18, starting with verse uh, 1. And the Lord is giving Jeremiah this illustration, and it's about the children of Israel. All right, then. It says, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah, and he said, go down to the potter's shop, and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped, so he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message, O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands. All right, then, once again, who's it directed to? It's directed to Israel, those who are called by his name. But the thing about it is, who is doing the crushing? God is doing the crushing. Oh, my goodness. So God is doing the crushing. And sometimes there needs to be a crushing. There needs to be a brokenness before there can be a healing. And that, 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 and I think there needs to be a, a brokenness that comes on the body of Christ that we can weep with those who weep a crushing. And, and, and sometimes this crushing is brought on by the Lord so that the healing can be done by the Lord. He wants to humble us. And we see this type of humbling also in Galatians, where it talks about in Galatians 6, a chapter, uh, Galatians 6, verses 2 and 3. And we see this same type of, you know, is dealing with pride. It says, share each other's burdens. In this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. He's saying you have to humble yourself. Because when, see, pride can keep you from bearing one another's burdens. Pride can keep you from weeping with those who weep. Pride will justify. Pride will point to its own accomplishments and says, look what I have done. Look what I have accomplished. I did this in my own power. And there is no brokenness. There is no humbling. Because it says, I believe to be humble, you're going to have to weep with those who weep. And if you're going to be humble, you're going to have to bear one another's burdens. Those are some qualifications. And we can't be pointing to our own thing because people will try to justify it. And this is why we have to come together. This is why there must be a oneness. This is why... We rejoice with those who rejoice, and we weep with those who weep. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting with verse 9. It reads like this. Two are better 
than one because they have a more satisfying return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and does not have another to lift him up. And that's what happens when the body is fragmented. That's what happens when the body is divided because you have these little islands. And when that island is in trouble, the other island says, that's your problem. Or there's another island in trouble. He says, no, that doesn't concern me because I don't want to hear what you have to say. And there's, there's going to come a time when there's going to be segments of the body of Christ that are they're going to come into the distress. And if there's no one to pick them up, up, there is going to be a grieving, there's going to be a, a, a mourning, and they're going to feel alone because there's nobody there to pick them up. And this is what we have to be on guard. But there is a solution. There is a solution to this for a fractured, divided, broken, hurting body. And one of the solutions is in James uh, chapter Five, starting with verse 13. This is out of the Amplified. And for me, I underlined how many times they say the word pray. All right, then this is James chapter 5, starting with verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? What does it say? He must pray. Is anyone joyful? He must sing praises to God. Is anyone among you sick? He must call on the elders, the spiritual leaders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick. Now the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another, your uh, false steps, your offenses, and pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, a believer, can accomplish much when put into action and made effective effective by God in his dynamic and it, it, is, it is dynamic and can have tremendous power. That's what we're talking about praying. We can start by praying for one another. Um, I was watching this uh, video on YouTube and there's this minister, his name is uh, Bishop uh, Kenneth Elmner. He's a uh, African-American pastor, the fa pastor of Faithful Central, which is a predominantly African-American church. And he was having a conversation behind this, the whole racial issue. And all, the, all he had on his screen, he had his close friends. And they, they were all white, but he called them his friends. And he had some big names up there when he was talking to them. He had, there was Rick Warren of Saddleback, Mega church. There was Phil Wagner of the Oasis. Mega church. There was Bayless Conley of Cottonwood Christian Center. Mega church. There was Glenn Barris, who was the, who was the former president of Foursquare. And then they had uh, the, uh, Dr. Barry Corey, who's the president of Biola University. Uh, you know, who's who? And these were his friends, and he called them his friends. A and, and there was such a trans transparency there. And he said to his friend, he, he says in the video, I am a recovering racist and you men, you, my, you're my friends who are the men who are helping me in my recovery. And as I watched him and he, as he began to share with these men, you could see the, the, the anger and you could see the, the, the weeping and he began to weep in front of them. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to leave my opinion on some of the responses. But 
there were some that entered into that weeping with him. And he was able to do that because they were friends. And his, his objective, his reaching out to these men was intentional. So that it, when you're intentional in reaching out to your friendships, it is not always easy. Because he could have easily been offended. He could have easily set himself apart. But because they were friends, there was a transparency that existed. And I would ask you, do you have a friend that you can be transparent before, that you can rage and question? And, and for me, just seeing that he was able to do that, that was refreshing. But in, if you're going to be intentional about reaching out to others, it's not going to be easy. It is not going to be easy. But that's what God calls us to do. This love walk is not an easy walk. If anybody says this love walk is an easy walk, you need to pray for them because they're, they're, they, they got a spirit that needs to be dealt with. Because try loving your enemy. That, 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 that is a love walk that is really, really difficult. And, but you have to be willing to make these type of connections. And one of the things that I read as, as I was praying over this message, uh, Isaiah chapter 41 came to me. And I may be taking it out of context, but this, this is what it says. Isaiah chapter 41, uh, verses 6 and 7. It says, everyone helped his neighbor. Everyone helped his neighbor. And this is how they helped each other. And he said to his brother, be of, good church, be of good courage. I want to read that again. Everyone helped his neighbor and said to his brother, be of good courage. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths with the hammer inspired him who strikes the anvil, saying it is ready for, for, for soldering. And he fastened it with pegs that it might not totter or fall over. Do you see what's happening? They're encouraging one another. They're saying, be of good courage. You're doing a good job. You're, you're ready. And, and they're, they're coming together, and there is this oneness, everyone helping his neighbor. This is an encouragement on how we're to build the house of the Lord, that we are being encouragement to one another, weeping with those who weep, Burdening, bearing one another's burdens, rejoicing with one another. Philippians, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 3, out of the Amplified. It says, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit through factional motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility being neither arrogant nor self-righteous. Regard others as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this same attitude in yourself, which was in Christ Jesus. And in the Amplified, it says, look to him as your example of selfless humility. This is what we have to do. And what did Jesus do? He died on the cross. That's what he's talking about, selfless humility. God Almighty, the great I am, coming here to redeem mankind. And he said, have that same attitude in you that was in Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 24. It says, let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds, not forsaking, not forsaking our meeting together as, be as believers for worship and instruction, as is the habit of some, 
but encouraging one another all the more faithfully as, and for me, I got this written, highlighted, I, I highlighted this, I underlined this, this spoke to me, as you see the day the, of Christ's return approaching. Brothers and sisters, as we see what's going on, is Christ coming back? Yes. So what are we to do? We're to encourage one another. This is what we're to do as we see the time of Christ approaching. But it must begin with what? Humility. For if God is going to heal us, there must be humility. That's the first thing he mentions. And what we have to realize is who God is. The first step that it takes is recognizing who God is and recognizing who we are and recognizing that sin is the great equalizer for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and God is holy. And, and I look at uh, Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse 5. This is the prophet Isaiah. He's having a vision. And he's, and, he's, and he's in the presence of the Lord. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, you know, I have been involved in prayer since like 1980. I've been involved in prayer, I, I, and I still, to this day, feel like the tax collector. When he said, when uh, Jesus talked about that parable, and he says, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Because I, when I come to a holy God, I recognize who he is, and I recognize who I am. And I recognize that it is only by his grace and mercy that I have access into his presence. Continuing on. And starting with verse 7. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. I, I, I always, when I, when I was a, a, a school teacher, when I'd always ask a student, hey, could you want to do a favor for Mr. Miley? they go, ooh, 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 yeah, me, Mr. Miley, he, me, 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 Mr. Miley. And this is, I can imagine, I, Isaiah, uh, who shall I send? Ooh, 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 me, God, send me, send me, ooh, ooh, ooh. And, and, and the Lord said, okay, then. And, and, and then he says, Go, tell, tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might, have, they, they, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Sometimes, you know, when I think about a message, sometimes I think, oh, who's it going to, how many people is it going to minister to? I'm not, who am I to talk about the body of Christ? I'm just pastor of La Mirada Four Square Church. And, you know, we got 20 people, 20 to 30 people on a good day. And then the Lord reminded me of the convalescent home. And where my wife and I, we've had the privilege to, to serve there for you know, 20 years until this pandemic. And there would be people there, maybe five or six, some of them not in their right mind, some of them falling asleep. And there would be, the, uh, uh, but it has been a rich and fulfilling experience. And my wife will tell you, Sometimes they got a better word at the convalescent home than you guys on Sunday got. <laughs> In other words, it, they, they were made in God's image. You are made in God's image, and thus it is important. It doesn't matter how many people hear it, 
But what matters is that you were all made in the image of the Lord, and God wants to minister, whether five people hear it or whether a hundred people hear it. That doesn't matter. What matters is, is that the word of the Lord goes forth and that it ministers to your heart and that, and that humility is the first step. So when we talk about humility, humility means to weep with those who weep. Humility is to bear one another's burdens. Humility is to help and encourage one another. Humility means to be, transformed, be transparent before a holy God and to your friends in Christ. That's what it means to be humble. And that's the first step. But when you look at it, there's more to it. It says, first, humble is just the first step. It says, what else it says? And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So prayer wasn't enough. Because you, you, it's like prayer and, it says, humbling and prayer and seeking my face and turning from your wicked ways. Those are all together. And then upon those four being enacted, then he says, then, after you've humbled yourself, after you have prayed, after you have sought my face, after you have turned from your wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Then. So we're going to go on with it. We're going to, we're going to look at that next week. <laughs> we're going to look at that next week. Because if we leave out any of them, we're missing an ingredient. And I'm here to tell you that the body is in need of healing. And so we deal with humbling. But now we're going to say we've got prayer, seeking his face, and turning from our wicked ways. But the word of the Lord that is speaking to you, the word of the Lord that is speaking to you who might be listening, watching me on Facebook, says this, the Lord is close to those who are a broken heart, and he saves such that are crushed with sorrow for sin and are humbly and thoroughly repentant. Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father, but through me. And those who are broken and hurting, those of you who see you're in a desperate situation, the Spirit of the Lord wants to minister to you. But it begins by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so I'm going to have you pray this prayer with me. And uh, if you're an audience, and I've just, uh, as I repeat the, as I say these words, I'd have you repeat with me. I recognize my need of the Savior. I believe that Jesus died for the forgiveness of my sins. I confess my sins. I ask the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart God raised Jesus from the dead. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I ask to be filled with your Holy Spirit. If you've made that confession of faith for the first time, you are now born again. Amen. Amen. And I want to pray with you, but I also want to pray uh, for those of you who maybe this message has been kind of challenging. It, it's been challenging for me. I had to call one an older brother in the Lord and have him pray with me. And it is a challenging message. But I want to pray. Heavenly Father, Humbling ourselves is not always easy. But we need an encounter with a holy God. Because when we have an encounter with a holy God, we recognize who you are, and we recognize who we are, and we recognize that we are in need of forgiveness. So we confess our sins. 
whatever that sin might be that has not been pleasing in your sight, we ask that you'd forgive us. And as we confess it, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we're praying, there may be something that the Spirit of the Lord might be bringing to your attention. Don't, 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 don't quench it. But that's the Spirit of the Lord speaking to you. Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is ministering to your people. And whatever that issue that we might be dealing with, it might be pride. It might be we have a, a, a bad attitude. Maybe we, we, we have offended our brother or sister. Maybe we don't believe certain things exist. Father, we ask that you would cleanse us and wash <coughs> us because we do want to be that church which is out without spot or wrinkle. That is our desire, Father. But it can only be done because of your grace and mercy. So we ask, Father, that you would just shower us with your grace, shower us with your mercy, begin to heal your body, Father, as only you can. We ask, Father, that those brothers and sisters who have felt left out, those brothers and sisters who have been feel isolated, those brothers and sisters who have been hurt, those brothers and sisters who feel that justice hasn't been done, those brothers and sisters who feel that there may justice has been done. We pray for each and every one that we might come together as one because that is your will. And in this we just give you praise, honor, glory, and power. For as in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I just want to read uh, Hebrews 13, uh, verses 20 through 21. And this is the benediction for La Mirada Four Square Church. Now the God of peace, who brought you up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us, that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. Praise God. Well. <clears throat>